Boom. Look at that. Take take it away. Awesome. All righty. Well, today we are here with um, Josh. Um, Hello. He's going to tell us how to garden in his style. Um, so, Josh, why not, before we um, get into your growing style, why don't you just let us know, like, how did you come up, or how did you get the nickname uh, The Hobbit, or doing stuff <laughs> The Hobbit style? Uh, I actually got that nickname from a gentleman who uh, uh, started a company called Green Air Products. His name is uh, Harmon, and uh, he was a good friend of my friend uh, Rick Williams. Uh, he owned the, the store I originally started working at in 2003 uh, in Salem. And uh, we were out on, I believe it was, uh, we were out and on a what, what What kind of store for those who don't uh, that know? That was uh, the Indoor Garden Center in Salem. It was uh, one of the first hydro shops in uh, Salem, Oregon uh since the 90s uh there was a there was a store previously in salem in the 90s but unfortunately back then there was also uh the police had a, a uh i believe it was called operation green sweep and that was where they followed uh, people from hydro stores to their homes and uh if those people were growing uh something that was illegal at that time they raided those houses and then they went back to the store and tried to hold them responsible for selling them equipment uh, fortunately, that went to the Supreme Court in Oregon, was found unconstitutional, and uh, they didn't get away with that anymore. But uh, the stores, unfortunately, went out of business because they didn't have you know, money to fight the case and keep the store open. But fortunately, they did not go to prison because of that. But, uh, you know, uh, my friend Rick thought it would be a good idea to open the hydro store there because back then there was no hydro stores between Eugene, Oregon and Portland, Oregon, and Salem was right there in the middle. You know, a logical place to open up, and uh, uh, he did that in I believe uh, 2001, and I started working for him a couple of years later. I was actually one of his first customers the day he opened. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, uh, me and my brother would go in there all the time and get our uh, stuff, and uh, yeah, it was a great little shop. But uh, uh, but he uh, was uh, the gentleman who helped him open that shop uh, was someone he used to work for, and his name was Harmon, uh, and uh, he was the gentleman who started Green Air Products, and uh, you know he. Uh, basically took all of the uh, uh, large scale greenhouse equipment, thermostats, CO2 burners, CO2 equipment, and he made them user friendly and for the uh, for the home garden, you know, all from the guy, anybody from a closet all the way up to a, a big garden. He also had one of the, has one of the best fertilizer lines that I've ever used. Uh, it's called uh, the Genesis line. Uh, they're a, a fantastic uh, company. Uh, I really like these guys. They've got uh, fantastic products and they're made in Oregon. Uh, you know, they used to be much larger than they are now, but that's the, you know, that's the go of the business. I believe his son, Cedar, is now uh, running uh, uh, Green Air Products and runs his own fertilizer line called Newt's Newt's, which is a, an improved version of the Genesis line. Yeah, here we go. Love these guys. You know, they got to, if I got to pick, uh, you know, I'm not a as much of a chemical fertilizer guy these days, but uh, this is by far my favorite uh, chemical fertilizer line. You know, it's a basic uh, three part and you use it like a two part. So you use the grow and the micro base or the bloom and the micro base in equal amounts. And uh, uh, you don't need a lot of supplements with it. You know, uh, I like to use uh, organic enhancers with it, like fulvic acid, humic acid. Uh, they've got a fantastic seaweed supplement called uh, uh, High Tide and uh, use that as a foliar spray with a product like Full Power and uh, uh, get amazing results. In fact, uh, uh, a gentleman, uh, uh, Oh, oh, when was that? That was uh, years ago, probably in the early. Well, one of, one of the first uh, really put well put together gardens I ever saw back then was uh, uh, was a small a small garden in a guy's uh, dual, uh, double car garage, and it was uh, two uh, uh, two sets of uh, four by eight tables, and they had each table had a a thousand watt uh, sodium on a light mover with a big old. Uh, uh, parabolic hood you know one of the big umbrellas and uh each one of those was covering uh 20 plants and uh, uh you know uh in each uh light because of the room way it was set up the lights would pass each other so no light no plant was ever left in the complete darkness and it had a, a nice co2 system and the floor was gravel you know so uh he ran a, a non-recirculating hydroponic system uh that was a, a top feed so he used a quarter minus pea gravel in five gallon buckets and uh, he had a 55 gallon drum and, uh, you know, or uh, I believe he actually had uh, a one 55 gallon drum with a pump. And then he had two dummy barrels that were attached to that via the bottom to give him an additional 110 gallons 
if he needed it. And uh, uh, he'd set that up to feed 45 seconds every 45 minutes, uh, just drained to waste just enough to get the rocks wet and uh, little trickles out the bottom. And uh, uh, yeah, that was uh, uh, that room was pulling uh, 20 pounds every 60 days and oh, wow. did that for, for years. You know, and that was one of the first real gardens I ever saw. And that was like, again, early, very early 2000s. Hmm. You know, I think 2000, I, yeah, I was about 21 when I saw that garden for the first time. And uh, I was blown away. You know, up to that point, I had, uh, I was stoked to get, you know, most of a pound out of a, a thousand watt light, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, but uh, 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 that showed me that there was so much more. And it was all about dialing in my environment and uh, uh, having uh, uh, everything set the way it should be. You know, and having you know good clean practices and good clean fertilizers. Yeah. But uh, uh, the gentleman uh, who showed me that was just a a, a really nice guy, and uh, he taught me more about uh, growing than just about anybody. And that was my friend Rick Williams. And he was uh, the one who gave you the 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 nickname the Hobbit. Uh, actually, uh, me and him were out uh, uh, camping with uh, Harmon, and uh, back then I liked to wear Chuck Taylors, and uh, I'm not very tall. You know, I'm only about uh, uh, five six, five eight, something like that, and but I've got very big feet. And uh, I was sitting at a convenience store eating a uh, sandwich, and uh, he looked over and looked at my feet and said, "You look like a hobbit." And uh, it uh, he called me hobbit ever since, and it kind of stuck, you know. <laughs> so That's ever cool. since then, uh, I've been a hobbit. <laughs> cool. And so today we're we're here uh, to. Uh, talk about your your growing style the hobbit growing mm -hmm. style you wrote kind of an article for biowag that was a kind of a good introduction um but eric and i were kind of talking a bit about growing in mineral soils last week and so i thought this would be a good follow-up to have you on and kind of talk about how you grow and stuff mm -hmm. so um if you want to start with you know what just kind of go off what you were just talking about with uh, your how you learned and then controlling the environment and stuff also the evolution kind of from how yeah. you started growing to like iteratively where you are now okay uh back then uh you know salem was right on the line you know uh, everything north of me all my customers north of me were all hydro guys everyone south of me was organic soil you know so in salem i kind of had a 50 50 mix you know but if you go up to you know uh, uh, just a, a couple miles north of me everyone up there was using chemicals and hydro you know, a couple miles south of me, even just to, to Albany, which is maybe, you know, five minutes down the road, everyone's doing organic soil. So uh, I kind of had to play both worlds when I was at the store, even though I was mostly a hydro guy, which forced me to learn, uh, uh, you know, both methods of uh, gardening. And, uh, you know, you know, because if you're showing someone and you're selling something stuff, you got to know what you're talking about, you know, so you got to take it home and you got to play with it, you know, otherwise you're just reading what's off the label and you're not very much help. You know, and, uh, you know, you get that in any chain store, but in a small store, you, they expect more help than that, you know, and, and for good reason. But uh, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my track there. Uh, Your early days growing. Early days growing. Okay. So uh, so after seeing that garden, I uh, went home and uh, basically uh, uh, threw away all my handmade, homemade uh, environmental crap. And uh, uh, went and uh, uh, borrowed some money from some friends and some family and got my first dehumidifier and got my first uh, uh, exhaust fan thermostat and my first CO2 system. And uh, that was the big game changer in my garden. You know, uh, then I didn't have the convenience of uh, running a non-recirculating hydro system because I did, wasn't in a home that I owned. So uh, I was running uh, deep water culture buckets, uh, bubble buckets. And uh, so uh, I got everything set up in the basement and uh, did my first run. And uh, I ended up, uh, uh, you know, getting out of uh, four 600 watt lights, uh, pulling about uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about eight and a half pounds, somewhere in that neighborhood. It wasn't uh, very good. I didn't know how to flush. Uh, I didn't know. I dried my plants in about a week. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it, uh, it was a very much a learning experience. And uh, from there, I kind of stuck <laughs> with the, the hydro thing for the next several years. Uh, basically following my friend's direction and not changing much until, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, supplements started coming out. You started seeing more lines with uh, adding more stuff in there, like uh, Botanicare, Advanced Nutrients. Uh, you know, the store I was uh, uh, working at was the first store in Oregon to carry Advanced Nutrients way back then. I think it was like in 2004, or 2005. I don't, I don't remember exactly. 
But uh, that's when I started noticing the benefit of adding, uh, you know, fulvic acid, humic acid, uh, adding different uh, uh, bloom boosters, uh, adding a different amino acid supplements and seeing a positive difference every time I incorporated that. You know, but there was always a price to be paid, especially in a recirculating system where, you know, either it would affect my pH or it would uh, gum my system up. And each one of those was a little bit of a learning curve trying to get uh, back to that uh, uh, point where I was getting the quality that I saw uh, with that first garden that my friend was producing. And mm -hmm. I just couldn't quite get there with the recirculating hydro systems without spending money on stuff like chillers and really having the ability to really take uh, the environments that I was in and make them a living environment. And when you're renting, that's really hard to do. Yeah, you know, that's very hard to do, especially before the time when we had any tents or any of these uh, easily set up gardens that can be, work much better in a in a compromised space than you know building something yourself. And I'm not that handy with wood. You know, I'm not much of a builder. So uh, fortunately, uh, my roommate at the time was and uh, very much helped me. Uh, oh, there's my dog barking at the mailman. Sorry about that. <laughs> Quiet up, George. Okay. George is a cutie. He's a <laughs> he's allowed to make mistakes, right? <laughs> yes, he is. You know, but, uh, uh, that was also the same time I started learning about the benefits of foliar sprays. And uh, the quality I got uh, in, uh, as far as like my growth patterns and being able to get uh, uh, just better, happier looking plants in a hydroponic system was night and day. And uh, that was really where I noticed the benefit and where I could take a lot of the organic stuff I'd like to run and not put it in with my fertilizer, you know, which, uh, you know, comes up the works and causes pH issues, but I can still get the benefit and use less and, you know, get the same effect, except I just got to go in and spray a couple of times a week with these, uh, you know, some seaweed, humic acid, silica supplements, amino acids, yep, you know, yep. it, it just depends on, you know, the, the program you want to follow, you know, but those are the, you know, four basic supplements I've used for years to enhance, you know, the quality and uh, uh, flavor of, of my plants with chemical fertilizers, mm -hmm. you know, uh, eventually I got to the place where I could uh, have a, a you know, they started coming out with these low profile trays, you know, uh, before, uh, uh, you know, before 2000 and I don't know, seven, 2008, all you could get were these really big flood trays. So they were hard to move around. They were hard to fit in there. They came out with a, a two by eight, uh, a low profile uh, tray. So I was able to, you know, take my medical garden at the time and install those on small risers. And I was able to set up a non recirculating uh, a hydroponic system. You know, and uh, back then in Oregon, uh, you were allowed to uh, grow six plants per patient. And I had uh, uh, three patients, uh, but uh, I only had enough room for about nine plants. You know, so I instead of growing multiple plants, 20 plants per uh, four by eight, I ended up growing one plant per four by four square with one 600 watt high pressure sodium over each four by four by four space. Yeah. You know, and that worked very well. I just used five gallon buckets of pea gravel again with uh, uh in the veg cycle i would go uh, 45 seconds every 45 minutes non-recirculating and uh those uh, uh, a 55 gallon drum would last me about anywhere from three to four days give or take so again i would dummy up two uh 55 gallon drums for a total of 110 gallons and that would last me more than a week you know mm -hmm. so i could mix up my fertilizer and the beauty of the non-recirculating system is once you you know, you got it set and you got the pH going, you check it an hour later, you know, you've got a monitor on it telling your pH, your, your nutrient temperature and your parts per million. There's not a lot for it to change as long as there's not a lot of uh, uh, biology going on in there. And even then there's ways of stabilizing that, you know, because it's not constantly going to the plants and coming back again, you know, running through tubes. It's just feeding the plants with the perfect pH, the perfect parts per million, whatever you set it to. And it's running through the plant and then just a little trickle runoff. You know, you don't want a ton, you know, but you need a little, you know, and uh, uh, with that system and, you know, pea gravel, you know, I, I used other mediums as well. I had really good luck with rock wool. Rock wool was probably my, my second favorite. Actually, I found that uh, I could get really good uh, uh, flavors uh, using rock wool over pea gravel. Uh, uh, and I, I, I wasn't quite uh, sure why that was, you know, but uh, when I grew my plants with uh, loose rock wool instead of pea gravel, uh, I could incorporate uh, uh, more uh, uh, organic matter. And I think there was more biology going on in that fibrous medium than there was with just the raw pea gravel. You know, yeah. but uh, I also uh, uh, did the same uh, uh, thing with uh, cocoa fiber. When cocoa fiber started becoming readily available and affordable, you know, a mixture of, uh, uh, you know, like, a, a, 
you know, 50, 50 or, or uh, uh, 60, 40 per light to, to cocoa fiber. And that worked very well, but I found to get the yields that I like with uh, cocoa fiber, I needed a larger container growing large plants. You know, I could continue to do those, but I had to, I had to increase my water regimen so much using like a five gallon bucket to grow a plant that was the shape of a four by four by four space that, uh, 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 that I was going through too much, too much reservoir at a time, you know, even compared to using something like a, a pea gravel, you know, cause even when the pea gravel, you know, it, 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 the, the roots filled up in there, but you always got good flow through it. It never really uh, got so root bound that it packed it up. But I never, I never flowered my plants much longer than like a, you know, a four week uh, uh, veg cycle to a, you know, about an eight to nine week flower cycle, you know, and that that was about perfect for you know that size of bucket. Yes. I experimented with larger containers and larger plants, but that was my sweet spot. You know, with that I could get anywhere. You know, with a six hundred watt light, you know, uh, you know, my average was about eighteen to twenty ounces of plant. You know, with the uh, you know the exception of my very high yielding plants like uh, you know. Uh, Sour diesel was one of my favorites. Uh, you know, uh, I had a very nice blueberry cutting. You know, I could get closer to 30 ounces, you know, 28 ounces on an average, you know, in that space with those plants. And, uh, you know, I, I was doing very, very well uh, uh, with those yields. You know, I was able to produce enough for all of my medical patients plus some and, uh, uh, you know, provide them with enough to where they could make uh, uh, concentrates if they wanted to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, bubble hash and uh, edibles if they chose to. And uh, they never wanted for anything, and it worked very, very well, yeah. you know. Uh, but uh, over time, I started uh, uh, experimenting with, uh, uh, you know, compost teas and with organic uh, supplements. Back then, uh, the impression was, and the general impression was that, you know, hydroponics got you real good yields and real good quality. Organic <clears throat> was supposed to be better, but it was very, very hard, if not impossible, to get the same yields, mm -hmm. which uh, I found at the beginning to be true. But I just found that really depends on how you grow your plants. Again, the plants you're growing and the environment and how well it's dialed in. Nine out of 10 yield problems I've seen over the years come to how your garden's put together and how you run your garden versus the plants you're growing, you know, and the fertilizer you're using. You know, fertilizer <laughs> grows plants, you know, uh, uh, you know, hydroponic systems grow plants. It's just to what end and what is your, you know, what's your end goal? Everybody says they want quality, you know, but uh, uh, quantity is at the end of the day, you know, what really counts when it comes to a commercial garden, you know, whereas with a medical garden, you know, quality is king. You know, you're producing medicine for sick people. That's got to be as clean as humanly possible. Yeah. You know, and, uh, uh, you know, I had a lot of uh, customers in my store at the time that were experimenting with these highly emitted soils with uh, using traditional potting soil with uh, organic liquid fertilizers or just uh, relying on uh, uh, compost teas for their main source of food. Well, and then there were that was when uh, the, all of these different uh, marijuana specific uh, uh, organic fertilizers came out. There was uh, one from Ad Advanced Nutrients called uh, oh, Earth Tea or something like that. It was called Earth Something, and they had a grow and a bloom tea. And uh, then there was the iguana juice grow and bloom uh, that they had, and uh, you know uh, uh, several others. You know, Earth Juice was always very very popular. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, you know, and they, they work pretty good for, for the results that you got. But, you know, as soon as I started mixing my own organic soils, you know, with uh, either pre-mixes that I got from places like Down to Earth or Fox Farm, you know, or uh, following a, a, a recipe I got online or from a book, I had great luck with the, these uh, recipes from a gentleman. I think his name was Vic High or High Vic or something like that. But uh, he had all these great recipes that you mixed right into a bale of sunshine number four. And, uh, you know, you just, you, you know, just follow his recipe with this amount of chicken crap, this amount of manure, this amount of this. The problem back then was uh, a lot of those products weren't consistent in their quality. You know, so incorporating a lot of uh, uh, cow manures and uh, uh, chicken manures, you know, uh, I, I find I, I didn't get the results that I wanted as far as uh, quality and flavor that I know was, you know, potential there. Yeah. You know, uh, but uh, uh, I ended up getting a book out of a, a or I'm sorry, a recipe out of a, a, a magazine called Skunk Magazine. And it was <laughs> written by a gentleman called The Rev. And uh, uh, that's when I really started uh, going, uh, uh, learning about a living organic soil, you know, because uh, he had these uh, fantastic tea recipes that I started incorporating with these uh, 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 highly amended soil recipes. And that's what, that's really what I'm more into today. Mm -hmm. You know, but uh, uh, really what uh, uh, as far as when I do consulting and I go out into the world and talk to commercial gardens, 
most commercial gardens today are using simple two-part hydroponic fertilizer, you know, in some sort of a top feed system on tables, be it with multiple small plants, that's the popular, or if they're, uh, you know, limited by numbers in a medical garden, they've got fewer larger plants in uh, 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 bigger containers. Mm -hmm. But it just depends on, you know, what they're looking to get out of their garden and the rules that, and the plants that they have to deal with. Most uh, gardens today are, you know, across the country are growing, you know, similar plants, you know, your cookies, your gelatos, and most, almost all those plants will grow very well and yield very well with multiple smaller plants per table. But uh, uh, my favorite recipe for high quality yields is 20 plants per four by eight square, you know, and over that four by eight square, you've got somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand watts of light, whether you've got, uh, you know, three, uh, 315 watt ceramics, whether you got a, a couple of LEDs that are around 900 watts, or whether you got one of those big double enders that's uh, you know 14 foot in the air and it's uh, giving you that nice spread, you know with that uh, uh, great hood that gives you that long spread like from uh, Hydro Farm or from uh, PL, uh, mm -hmm. you can get that same yield. You know it just depends on how your infrastructure is put together. But having the ability to set your you know my temperature is this, my humidity is this, my uh, CO2 parts per million is this. You know, those are imperative to get those quality yields consistently. You know, you can get them once or twice a year in a room that's not dialed in and it'll be okay. But it's really about, you know, having that to, to get those consistent yields consistently, you know, four five, six times a year or multiple times a month. You need to have your environment dialed in. You got to know, you know, the quality that you're dealing with and you got to have your, you know, bug and fungus situation dialed in a lot. You've got to, those can't be an issue that you got to have your protocol for Monday through uh, uh, Sunday, and it's got to happen unregardless. People don't wait, or I'm sorry, plants don't wait on people, people wait on plants. Mm -hmm. And that's just how it's going to be. You know, you have to uh, listen to your plants. They'll tell you everything they need. It's just, you know, uh, you know, listening to them and learning to listen. You know, but like I said, most commercial gardens, they've got that dialed in today. There's fantastic places you can go to to get your lighting set up for you to where you don't, you've got your proper amount of uh, output per square foot. You've got uh, uh, these fantastic companies that can come in and set you up with everything and get you dialed in, you know, and then you've got these awesome doser systems to where you can hook up, uh, uh, you know, com uh, this uh, high quality commercial fertilizers, you know, stuff like uh, Athena's and uh, so on and hook those up in line and uh, you don't have to do a lot of thinking. It's all dosed for you at a specific parts per million, you know, and it works really well and really consistent. You know, you just got to do a couple little things to get your quality up you know, with those systems, you know, using biostimulants, incorporating, uh, uh, you know, organic uh, inputs, you know, however you can be that through the root zone or as a foliar spray. Just a couple of organic additives in a system like that can make a huge difference in your taste and flavor profiles uh, of those plants, you know, mm -hmm. and it doesn't take a lot of money to do that. And the, really the, everyone's got uh, uh, big, dense, pretty flowers, you know, but uh, I've been in dispensaries all over the country. It's flavor that's rare. You know, it's the, you know, and keeping that flavor. You know, I come in on Monday and it's great. I come on Friday and it's hay, you know, and that's because it, it wasn't dried properly and it wasn't necessarily flushed or grown well, mm -hmm. you know, but it was grown well enough, you know, and now it's for sale, you know, uh, it, but uh, it just depends on what that garden really wants to get out of and where they sit in the market. If you're fighting over those bottom two shelves, you know, uh, good luck and, uh, you know, do it. It's all about the dollar then. Yeah. You know, but then you're competing with those outdoor guys that don't have to pay for lights. You know, <laughs> if you're, in my opinion, if you're using lights, you need to get the best quality you can out of that space, you know, because you're you're paying the big mucks for those for that juice. Yeah. Your, you your stuff is some of the best stuff I've, I've ever smoked in my in my entire life. So and you've come you've been growing for all this time. Like, what would you say? is your is is how you get the highest quality cannabis like what what does your system look like now yeah you know, well i would say that depends on the type of plants that i'm growing uh if i'm uh, most of the time i'm of the opinion that organic living soil will grow you a better higher quality plant every time than chemicals but chemicals can give you higher consistent yields in a commercial environment but I've also seen organic gardens on a high, on a very large scale do just as well as chemical gardens. It just depends on that balance, you know, that they're achieving, you know, but, uh, uh, but my favorite way to get uh, uh, high quality is through highly amended soils with uh, high quality biostimulants, compost teas, good flushing. And the big thing is slow, consistent drying and curing. 
The difference between a 50 cent cigar and a $50 cigar isn't what the tobacco was grown with. It was how long was it cured? How well was it cured and who rolled it? You know, that's the difference, you know, and it's the, the big difference with uh, cannabis. You know, if you want, you know, good quality cannabis to last a good long time, you know, uh, grow it with a good quality chemical fertilizer or even better, an organic fertilizer, dry it very slow and then, you know, uh, uh, have it in a container cured, you know, preferably, uh, you know, uh, checked on and burped multiple times uh, a week. And, uh, you know, uh, I've had cannabis that I've kept, you know, nice and flavorful for almost a year before it starts to fade uh, mm -hmm. in its taste. Whereas if I grow it with my hydro system and I dry it in two weeks on a rack, you know, and then throw it in a jar or throw it in a bag, you know, that'll keep its flavor for about four months, you know, maybe six months, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, maybe a little bit longer. If I do something fancy, like uh, throw it in a nitrogen sealer or, you know, uh, uh, air airtight uh, jars or some, some thing like that. But, uh, but really, uh, uh, you know, to get that, uh, you know, the other thing that you see a lot with uh, cannabis that's uh, uh, dried improperly is it breaks into small pieces. You know, you get a lot more larf, you get a lot more uh, dust and fluff uh, just from handling your flour, you know, mm -hmm. just by moving it around. You don't see that as much with good quality, slow dried cannabis. And I think it's uh, something that is truly missing and isn't focused on enough when it comes to large scale cannabis production. You see it a lot with the smaller gardens just because, you know, they can do it, you know, but uh, some, all these large gardens are the, the same thing, you know, uh, 10 days and it's dry and, you know, they cut it up into small pieces and away we go, you know, and uh, logistically with how much flour they have to go through, I don't necessarily blame them for doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you got to work with the scale that you're at and you got to work with the, the problems that you're dealing with, you know, so uh, you can't necessarily, what worked for a, a you know, a, a 50 light garden isn't going to work for a 300 light or a, a 2000 light garden. Mm -hmm. you know, you just got to, you know, deal with, you know, that's why they got those uh, big trimming machines, you know, over the, you know, the couple of guys with the scissors, you know, yeah. but it just depends on what lane you, you, you want to stay in, you know, and whether you're a quality producer and you're standing, you know, you want quantity, you have to pay the bills, but you're, you're always going to reach towards uh, quality. You're always going to try to do that extra little bit to make it a little bit better, you know, and uh, spending that extra time to, you know, dry your plant slowly, you know, making sure that you, the big thing is, is that you flush your plants. You know, there's a big misunderstanding between flushing a plant for salt buildup in the medium and flushing a plant for harvest at the end. You know, those are two completely different things that are done with both organic and chemical fertilizers. You know, organic guys do it because they don't know they're doing it because they're just watering with water all the time. Mm -hmm. you know, so they're allowing their plants to metabolize all the fertilizer that's in the soil, in the medium and in the plant and gives it a nice fade into fall. You're imitating a season spring mm -hmm. summer or fall what what stage are you in you know at the end you got a lot of, you know in fall you got a lot of water plants fade from you know their nice green into a yellow purple pink you know whatever color they turn into mm -hmm. and uh you know if, if you don't uh, uh get that nice fade if you got an army green plant and you chop it down chances are it's not going to taste as good as one that was able to metabolize all of the fertilizer that was in those leaves mm -hmm. you know and it, in a hydroponic system uh, I, uh, I've always used uh, salt leaching solutions, you know, just because uh, I kind of treat them like soap, you know, so in, uh, like example, like, uh, my non-recirculating hydroponic system, every reservoir change in flour and every other reservoir change in my, uh, in my veg room, I would do a salt leach. And that's where I would take a product like clear X or flora clean. And I would fill up my reservoir half full. I would uh, put that product in there. I would pH balance it. And then I would just run it through my plants, all 25 gallons, you know, just one big wang. And then after that, I would take an equal to double the amount of plain water or uh, water with an enzyme in it, hydrozyme, SLF 100, you know, depending on how fancy I wanted to get, you know, but at very low doses, you know, you know, one mil, two mil per gallon. And I would, again, make sure it's pH balanced and I would run that through my medium. And that would flush away all the salt that is built up on the rocks, on the roots, and in the medium. And because I'm using rocks as a medium, I can flush through it as much as I want. You know, so I'm not over uh, oversaturating a medium. And because I can flush more often, I can wash away all those bad salts. And because I'm giving it a little bit all the time, instead of running 14, 16, 1800 parts per million, I'm running 1000 parts per million. I'm running 1100 parts per million. You know, and I'm matching my CO2 parts per million to about the same as my uh, the parts per million that's going into my plants. Mm -hmm. You know, I found that doing the matching those two uh, things on a general, 
you know, my, my CO2 parts million and my intake, uh, what my plants are taking in, I can get a lot higher yields if I keep those within a couple hundred uh, of each other. You mm-hmm. know, I can get more plants happy in the same system, you know, uh, you know, but it just depends on if you're monocrop or you've got many different types of plants growing in the same room being fed by the same fertilizer. All commercial gardens have got multiple plants. There's no real monocropping left in that world. Yeah. You know, but on a small scale, you can really, you know, when you've got one crop, one reservoir, you can really dial in those fertilizer recipes for that plant. You know, get the real good flavor of that OG Kush. Make sure you, you know, that really sensitive uh, uh, Malawi sativa, you can really get it, you know, really low parts per million where it's going to love it. Where if you had a, you know, a, a cookies plant sitting next to it, it's going to be starved to death. Mm-hmm. You know, but it's just, a, you know, that's the compromise of having a hydroponic system where everyone gets the same versus an organic living soil where the, each plant can take what it wants when it needs it. You yeah. know, and just enhancing that uptake with biostimulants or composties, you know, yeah. but, uh, uh, but uh, with uh, organic living soil, how much medium you have, how much space you have dictates how long that plant's going to be happy, you know, and how much food you have. You know, after that point, then you can supplement it with liquids and as the plant uh, gets root bound at the end of its cycle. With hydroponics, you know, uh, you know, the uh, root zone is far smaller, but it's constantly bathed or getting sprayed with a, you know, a nutrient solution. You know, so it's absorbing a lot more in a much smaller space. Uh, so you can use a much smaller container to get a higher yield. But I found that having anywhere between, a, you know, a number three to, you know, up to a one cubic foot five gallon bucket, you know, with multiple plants per table, that gives me the consistent highest yields with more plants than any other method. Mm-hmm. You, know, uh, you know, the way I explain it to these gardeners is, uh, you know, uh, you know, can you grow a four ounce plant in a five gallon bucket? Well, then you can get five pounds of light because you can fit 25 gallon buckets edge to edge on a four by eight table. Mm-hmm. You know, you can fit about one cubic foot of medium in each one of those buckets. Pick your medium, you know, cocoa fiber, perlite. You know, my favorite's pea gravel because it's cheap, but it's real heavy. You know, that's the catch you pay with the, the cheap medium is that it's heavy as hell. So you got to have an infrastructure <laughs> to move those heavy ass buckets. But, you know, I used to get, you know, pea gravel delivered. I think it was, you know, back in uh, uh, the 2000s, it was about $30 a yard. Mm-hmm. I had it delivered in my front yard and, you know, just scoop it up as I need it and dump it out in the back when I didn't. Pea gravel is very easy to deal with and, uh, you know, far more environmentally friendly than using something like a cocoa fiber or a rock wool you know, which is, uh, you know, manufactured or, or grown in another place. You know, everybody's got a, a rock quarry near them. You know, you just want to get the same stuff that they use in uh, uh, in uh, ashtrays. You know, that round little quarter minus pea gravel, preferably not with sharp edges. You know, mm-hmm. I thought that that's, a, you know, they even sell it. To, I bought it at uh, Home Depot before as decorative rock. <laughs> you know, uh, I actually found that, uh, you know, uh, when I was living at a, a house uh, that was up on the hills, you know, I didn't have a, a yard that I could dump a, a you know, a couple of yards of pea gravel on anymore. So I ended up going to, uh, to uh, I think it was Lowe's and buying pallets of decorative rock that were in one cubic foot bags. And they're, you know, all different colors, but it was the same stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, it was only about, uh, I want to say $2 a bag, which was, you know, $2 a bucket. Compare that to rock wool. Compare that to, you know, uh, cocoa fiber or even organic medium. It's far, far cheaper. You know, the yeah. beauty of a good... A uh, uh, hydroponic system is that you can, you know, clean or reuse almost everything. You know, I could reuse my rocks again and again and again. Once I had two piles, you know, I got one pile I'm using and one I'm dumping out. You know, and uh, the one I dump out, I dump out on the ground and I rake out the roots, throw those out, and then pile it back up. And I can reuse those infinitely. You know, because it's just rocks. Yeah. You, know, you just got to make sure that the, the very big disadvantage to this system is electricity. You know, and uh, uh, relying on it, you know, because that's that's your Achilles heel. If your power goes out for more than half a day, you've got very upset and pissed off plants. And because <laughs> they're in rocks, you can't hand water them six times a day. There's just not enough time of the day to go and do that. So uh, uh, you better have a backup for your electricity running a system like that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's performance versus forgiveness. That's the compromise with all hydroponic systems. You know, you know how how high performance it is will definitely make it more reliable on that power. And when that power goes away, you know the power is gone. You know, yeah. and that, you are the one manually feeding your plants. Mm-hmm. You know, but uh, uh, you know, but most good uh, gardens have got some sort of a backup for that. You know, but uh, yeah. uh, 
I found that, uh, you know, the, the other wonderful thing about doing the multiple plants per uh, table was back in the day, uh, you know, what we do is before there was any trellis netting available, you know, which is uh, which I absolutely love the plastic trellis netting. We'd have to make our own trellis out of Romex and PVC, you know, so we'd take, uh, you know, a, a one and a half inch PVC and make a frame the same size as our table. And we'd run that to pulleys uh, just above the lights. And uh, then we'd run Romex across and make either six inch or eight inch squares. And then we'd lower that down uh, uh, when it was time, when the plants got to size. And mm -hmm. there would be a, a four by four post on each corner with screws in it. And that's what would support the, uh, uh, the uh, racking with the trellis on it. And after the plants had uh, stretched through it through flower or grown through it, depending on how whether they stretched, those plants stretched in flower and how much they stretched, mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, then you flower and then the, the wonderful thing we do back then was you just cut everything down and we'd take the whole net and we'd just, you know, put hang it up on some bike hooks in the drying room, you know, so we didn't have to pull anything down. It was already grown through the trellis and we just let it dry like that, <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, it worked great. You know, uh, it'd take a little bit longer to dry and a little bit more of a pain in the butt to cut them out of there. But as long as I had one set to dry and one set to go, I could perpetually, you know, pull those out every, you know, two months. And uh, uh, yeah, it, it worked fantastic. You know, and, you know, and with the, the gravel floor, uh, you know, if you're lucky enough to have one, you just, you know, dump the literally, you know, chop the plants down, dump the gravel on the floor, pick the root ball up, throw it in the garbage can, scoop up the gravel that's next to the pile on the floor, scoop what you used last time into the hole, set it back on the table, put a cutting in it, put your spray stake on it and you're good to go. Mm -hmm. You know, and, uh, it, you know, you never have to worry about, you know, uh, really uh, uh, soil borne uh, problems unless you have a, a bug problem. You know, like a you know, like a, a root aphid or a fungus gnat issue. The one problem that I ran into with a non-recirculating system was I ignored a fungus gnat issue for about half a year because it really wasn't affecting my yields very much, and I didn't really care. So I just threw a couple of yellow traps in there. I didn't really use any larvicides. I really didn't care. You know, but uh, uh, you know, eventually I ended up uh, uh, getting a, a, a disease called Vexillium wilt. You know, and uh, I had never seen that before. I actually had to go to a farmer friend of mine and say, hey, man, what's, what's happening with my plants? I go in when the lights are on and everything's wilted. And when the light shut off, they come back. He's like, oh, shit, man. You know, that... yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I butcher those names. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I just wanted but, to uh, make sure. I, I was... So I ended up ordering a book from England at the time on hemp pests and diseases. And uh, my buddy uh, uh, Bryce helped me uh, figure out, uh, you know, what was going to work. So we ended up, uh, 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 the, what ended up really getting me at that time was I was doing all of my cuttings in aeroponic cloners. So I took cuttings off of those sick plants and put them in my cloning machine with my plants that weren't sick and ruined my entire stock. Mm. You know, and uh, by the time I figured that out, it was too late to treat them. You know, they, uh, you know, all the treatments that I tried really didn't do anything. You know, so I ended up just having to start over from scratch because that was the easiest thing to do. But it was a very much a learning lesson. You know, don't ignore bugs, even if they're not, uh, you know, uh, causing a harm. They can transmit diseases. Mm -hmm. You know, that's worse than uh, uh, any bug damage, you know, especially root-borne bugs. But uh, I found in a good hydroponic system, as long as you're not exposing yourself to, uh, uh, to bugs via your environment or introducing new plants, it's a lot harder to get uh, uh, those... Uh, 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 bugs to come in if you don't have an organic matter for them to live in as far as a soil or a medium mm -hmm. you know pea gravel is not a very conducive medium for most bugs to live in yeah <clears throat> you should uh you should tell the story about how you got started doing um like or how you met bob and then how you got into oh. selling like like full power and stuff and then how and then how you ended up incorporating that into your garden or the sequence, but that story is a really good story. Okay. Well, uh, uh, the, uh, it first started off with, uh, uh, we had, a uh, at the store, uh, an older gentleman came in and, uh, uh, gave me a trick on using uh, humic acid and seaweed as a foliar spray. And, uh, I asked uh, my buddy Rick and, uh, Harmon about it. And they're like, Oh yeah, you know, uh, you know, that, that works awesome. In fact, at the time there was a lot of expensive products that were just that on the market and uh, they didn't tell you, but, uh, uh, but it was just a combination of some kind of humic and some kind of seaweed. So uh, uh, what uh, 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 me and Rick did was uh, we took, uh, uh, I think it was uh, just a common potting soil. I think it was the down to earth potting soil. And we took uh, 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 
you know, like a couple of uh, heaping table, a couple of heaping spoonfuls of uh, uh, of grow and bloom guano from down to earth and mix it in there and uh, uh, planted a couple of blueberry plants in it, you know, just in three gallon pots. And we watered them with humic acid. And that was it. You know, we just, uh, you know, put them in there, uh, vegged them for a couple of days to get the uh, roots established and then flowered them. You know, they were about maybe a foot and a half, two foot tall when they were done. Didn't yield incredibly well, but it was some of the best tasting uh, uh, pot, best tasting blueberry that I had grown at the time. And I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. there's really something to this. So uh, uh, later on that same year, uh, I was importing, uh, like I said, uh, the Indoor Garden Center was one of the first stores in Oregon to carry advanced nutrients. And we were bringing in uh, all these different uh, products, not just from advanced nutrients, but other companies from Canada because their products were getting very popular down here in Oregon. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, some of those products were humic acid and fulvic acid. And uh, they showed up uh, uh, to my store and they had already gone bad. They had either given me old stock or, uh, uh, or the product had gone bad because it had gotten too hot on the, on the way down. I don't know. But, uh, but I couldn't sell it because it, had, it was obviously putrid. And so uh, uh, the Department of Ag comes in on the same day and says, hey, man, those are not labeled properly. You can't sell those in Oregon. And I'm like, great, great. Not only is it bad, but I, I can't sell it and I can't send it back to Canada because I got to have a, a brokerage uh, guy do that for me. And <laughs> the company uh, that I got it from wasn't particularly nice about uh, uh, they, they basically didn't believe me. So I was complaining about this problem one day when Bob was in my store. Uh, Bob Faust was a customer of mine. I believe he was a medical uh, a patient at the time. And I sold him his lights and his uh, fertilizer stuff. And he said, you know, I was saying, hey, man, and I was complaining to actually, I think it was Rick. That uh, man, this uh, humic acid and fulvic acid showed up bad again. You know, what are we going to do with this? And Bob looks over and he goes, "Hey, man, I, I sell that in farmers and fifty-five gallon drums. You know, uh, uh, you know." Uh, I said, "Hey, man, throw it in quarts and gallons, and I'll start selling it for you." You know, and we were the first store to carry full power. You know, and that's when uh, he started taking all his other products like uh, his powdered humic acids. You know, his uh, uh, powdered micronutrient supplements and uh, uh, other stuff, and putting it in small packages for me to sell at my store. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I started, uh, you know, telling all the distributors about it, too. They'd come in, you know, the guys from Sunlight would come in or the guys from Hydro Farm would be like, what's the, you know, what's the best selling stuff you got? I was like, you know, this fertilizer and stuff from Full Power. You mm -hmm. know, like, well, what, what's what's all this uh, Full Power stuff? I'm like, I can sell it to everybody. You know, it it helps with organics. It helps with uh, chemicals. You know, I can, I can use it with my hydro food and I can use less and I get better quality or I can I can use it with my uh, organic food. and My yields are higher and, you know, I get better, faster root establishment in my veg, you know, mm -hmm. with thicker, heavier soils. But that's hard to do. And, uh, uh, you know, eventually it ended up uh, being so popular that they ended up uh, the uh, guys at uh, BioAg got it in at uh, uh, Sunlight Supply, now Hawthorne, you know, and then uh, Hydro Farm and all, all the other big distributors. And, you know, now it's available in just about every hydro store in the country. You know, but uh, but that's really when I started noticing the big difference of incorporating organic inputs with my chemical fertilizers, you know, mm -hmm. and using those same inputs with my organic fertilizer to get uh, uh, basically in similar ways to get uh, uh, different effects. You know, uh, with my chemical fertilizer, I'm getting all the yield and uptake I need out of the chemicals because, you know, they're, they're chemicals. They're, they go right into the plant. The, the disadvantage that I had with the chemicals was using them to the point where I got the yields that I wanted, I would pay for that in quality. You know, I would have, uh, you know, my plants would get larger, they'd get denser, but they wouldn't taste better at the end. The stuff I grew uh, organically or at a lower uh, uh, first million wouldn't yield the same, but it was a much higher quality. So I started uh, uh, experimenting at a lower partial million with higher CO2 and more organic inputs uh, like uh, uh, the big one was uh, full power, you know, so when I started using full power at, uh, you know, 10 to 15 mils and reducing my uh, uh, my chemicals down to around a thousand parts per million <clears throat> and uh, growing plants that were wider than they were taller, I really saw a giant increase in quality. You know, back then I was growing mostly sour diesel. So it was a plant that tended to double or triple in, in uh, size in flower. So I could grow a much smaller plant in veg, you know, and then transfer that over into my bloom room, you know, which is not easy to do when you're growing in pea gravel. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, I could get a, a much uh, better quality yield uh, by growing a smaller plant that ended up being a bigger plant at the end. You know, that's when I started really breaking that, uh, you know, one pound a plant mark and getting to the, you know, two, two and a half pound uh, uh, mark. I think 33 and a half ounces was about my limit back then. That was about as much as I ever got mm -hmm. you know, out of a plant. But that was in a five gallon bucket of pea gravel 
uh, with a, uh, a six foot tomato cage zip tied to the top of the five gallon bucket. You know, <laughs> that's how I, how I grew all my plants is I, I grew them all. Uh, I would take a, the biggest uh, round tomato cage I could get. I would find the rung that was about the same size as the circumference of the five gallon bucket. And I would cut it off to there, drill holes in the bucket and just zip tie it to the top and allow my plant to grow through that and bend it out as it was growing up, you know, and then use line to support that or have a trellis just above the, uh, literally that sat on top of all the cages so that when the plant stretched through it, there was something there to easily support them. Mm -hmm. It just depended on how many tops I had on those plants and, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know how they how they like to grow. You know, I found that that was the most difficult part with that system was uh, incorporating different plants of different sizes and shapes than different fertilizer likes. You know, everybody seemed to get along in the system as far as like liking the fertilizer, give or take. You know, this one's slight. Uh, you know, a little bit higher yield. This one's a little lower. But mm -hmm. uh, it was really the you know if this one didn't stretch like that one and it's two foot shorter, eh, that's an issue. You know, but then I started you know because uh, I was limited by the amount of plants I could grow because I was a medical gardener. So I would take my tall plants and I would run those in the center of my room under my center three lights. And then my shorter plants, I would run on the on the sides. So that way, my lower lights would light up the sides of the, the taller ones in the center. Mm -hmm. And again, I would get much higher yields with my uh, 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 plants that way. But uh, 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 but it just depends. Uh, you know, I that was kind of specific to those two plants back then. You know, uh, you know, one was a, 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 a Bubba Kush and the other one was Sour Diesel. Bubba Kush doesn't stretch at all. Sour diesel stretches a lot, you know, so they're hard to fit in the in the same space like that. But uh, uh, but uh, again, I'm going off on a tangent. Uh, after Bob uh, 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 came into the store and uh, uh, that uh, I started uh, talking with him a lot more about uh, my gardening problems, mm -hmm. you know, and he had a side of it that I hadn't really gotten a lot of detail on the more farmer agronomist, you know, uh, uh, a large scale side. You know, to that point, you know, I was really dealing with, uh, you know, n not many very large gardens. And uh, uh, Bob helped me uh, get, you know, figure, he helped teach me that logistics are everything when it comes to a large garden. You know, they'll kill you. You know, you'll get buried in needs if you don't uh, uh, meet, know what they are and meet them before they come and, and swamp you. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, he also, uh, uh, you know, about keeping stuff organized and keeping things as simple as humanly possible on, on a large scale. Uh, and uh, and the importance of just incorporating, uh, you know, even if you can just use humic acid a couple times a cycle, even if you can use full power three times a watering like a grass seed farmer can, you'll see a nice difference. You know, is it going to be the giant difference you'll see if you use it with every watering and every fertilization? No, you know, mm -hmm. but you got to use it to fit your budget. You know, I tell people to use as much fulvic acid as you can afford. You know, the more you can use, usually the, you know, the better quality, you know, and the less fertilizer you're going to use. But it just depends on to what scale and how you like to garden. Yeah. You know, I think that, uh, you know, uh, you know, there's a million different ways of getting to the same place. It depends on what you like to grow with and how you like to get there, you know, but if I'm growing in a, uh, in a commercial environment, you know, with, uh, with chemical fertilizers, I'm going to be uh, trying to incorporate more organic stuff in there to get me a, a higher quality, you know, mm -hmm. whereas if I'm in an organic environment, uh, you know, uh, uh, even on a large scale, I'm going to be using more of those products to get, give me a higher yield which means I'm going to be using them in a different fashion than if I'm using it with a, a hydroponic system. You know, mm -hmm. example would be, again, like full power. In a hydroponic system, I usually don't use much more than 10, 12 mils per gallon ever because it's constantly there and I'm giving it with every feeding all the time from the, the time that plant goes into that system to the time I, you know, till about two weeks to three weeks before I chop it down. You know, so a little bit all the time is how you want to give it. Whereas with my... Uh, uh, organic soil, I like to give it, you know, closer to, you know, 15 to 20 mils per gallon, you know, at least twice a week, you know, but again, if I can break that up into multiple waterings with an automated watering system, I'll again, go back to the multiple smaller waterings, you know, but it just depends on, you know, how you, how your stuff set up. I love having an automated watering system with organic soil, uh, where I got a, a big stock tank of plain water and it feeds my plants multiple times a day. Uh, with little bits so it keeps that perfect moisture level with my living soil that's what gives me the best quality yields with that system but you can get there with uh, hand watering it just depends on how disciplined you are and <laughs> the one thing you can't sell you can't teach you can't bottle it and if you can't even make a billion dollars and it's caring give a shit <laughs> you have to decide that you know your measure of you know how how often you want to go in that garden and how often you're going to be there and you have to take that into account if you're not going to be there, if you've got a family and kids, 
you need an automated watering system. You know, if you've just got a garden, a fish tank, and a dog, you know, take care of that fish tank. Go in there, hand water. It don't matter. Mm -hmm. you know? But, uh, you know, that's different styles to make your, your garden live with you. It's got to be uh, as convenient uh, as it is productive. If it's not, you know, you're inevitably going to treat it like a chore and it's not going to be as good as it should. Gardening should be fun, even when it's a job. When it stops being fun, uh, there's a there's an issue there. You know, <laughs> except when it comes to trimming. I hate trimming. Trimming's not fun. <laughs> oh, it, it hurts my hands, man. After trimming for eight hours plus, you just like oh, oh. yeah. Uh, coming from the time before there was ever a trimming machine, and then it was just you know me and three friends sitting down for you know every weekend after harvest until it was done. You know, back <laughs> then, you know, if we were lucky, we could get a pound done in about an hour and a half. You know, two hours, you know, trimming by hand, you know, uh, per person. But, you know, there were those, you know, strains that, you know, I, I've given up awesome strains just because, you know, <laughs> they, they take too long to trim. You know, uh, that's just, you know, the way it goes sometimes. <laughs> uh. But uh, uh, but Bob was a, a really big uh, help there uh, when it came to uh, progressing my knowledge and uh, uh, figuring out the difference between like a, a humic acid that was marketed towards the cannabis world back then versus a humic acid that he had, which was developed in the ag world and discovered the cannabis, you know, and there was a quite a big difference, you know, uh, you know, most of the humic acids and folic acids that I was using uh, that were marketed to the cannabis world were overpriced and usually were, uh, uh, there was some sort of a, a, a price to be paid with using them. You know, mm -hmm. I've had with any humic acid or fulvic acid that had an NPK value, like a 001 or a, you know, a, a, a 010, uh, those didn't work as well as uh, the stuff uh, that I got from Bob that uh, didn't have an any NPK because he wasn't using chemicals to extract it. You know, he was using uh, this uh, cold process that he developed, you know, for making his full power, which is what makes it work so well and why it's so compatible with so many different fertilizers where I would get these fulvic acids from Canada and other places. And they say, oh, you don't want to use this with your flowering food because it can interfere and uh, it screws something up with the fulvic acid. I'm like, that's mm -hmm. my favorite place to use fulvic acid is with my flowering food. <laughs> you know, so uh, uh, whoa, 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 I, I don't get it. But because of the way it was extracted with chemicals, it, it didn't work as well. And a lot of the time, uh, another thing I discovered with a lot of these cheaper companies is they'd start out with the humate, they'd extract the fulvic from the humate, and then they'd sell this is humic and this is fulvic. <laughs> Whereas at Bioag, when you buy humate, it's got fulvic in it, you know, because it was made for humic, you know, from humic, from the same product that we make the, the fulvic from. And it's made, you know, it's got everything in there, you know, and the fulvic uh, is made from a completely different process at a completely different place. So you're not, you know, uh, using one product to make another, you know, you know, those products are made separately. So they're both of the highest quality that you can get. You know, and uh, that's when I started going to places like uh, uh, concentrates, you know, and started uh, uh, getting a uh, uh, big, uh, uh, big uh, uh, bulk fertilizers, you know, 50 pound bags of guano and, uh, you know, really started getting into uh, uh, incorporating composties into my chemical fertilizers. Mm -hmm. So when uh, uh, when I was uh, running my top feed systems on a very regular basis, when I was running my uh, bigger medical uh, gardens, uh, at the, uh, uh, when I found that I got it, the best dialed is when I would run, uh, a, a combination of mineral and organic supplements for my veg and early flower. And as I got through flower, I would reduce the amount of chemical fertilizer to almost nothing, you know, by the time I got to my, uh, 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 uh flush. So I'm incorporating a lot of compost teas, a lot of, uh, already broken down organic products, you know, uh, there was uh, several from uh, uh, General Hydroponics and uh, uh, Advanced Nutrients and Botanic Air that I would use that were already uh, uh, broken down, different types of seaweeds, humic acids. I used to really like, uh, 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 what was it, uh, oh, Liquid Karma back in the day. Uh, you know, uh, uh, there was a product called G from GH called Flora Blend. Uh, then there were all these different uh, uh, Bacillus uh, 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 additives. Uh, I think one was called Subculture. There was another one called, uh, oh, uh, something B. It began with a, oh, I can't remember the name of it. But but anyway, uh, I would incorporate a lot of these, uh, all these bacterias in with my uh, 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 organic food along with a little bit of chemical. So my parts per million 
uh, with my chemical food would be somewhere in the neighborhood of like three to 500. And then I would add organic matter to get me up to about 600, 800 parts per million. And, uh, uh, you know, I'd run that for my last three to six weeks instead of incorporating bloom boosters like uh, Bud Blaster or Cool Bloom or, you know, these other uh, 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 potassium and phosphorus boosters. I would get that more from uh, guanos, kelps, uh, alfalfa, seaweed, you know, uh, stuff like that. You know, uh, I was a really big fan back then of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, pre-digested uh, uh, guano teas. You know, like a, a bud swell was a really good one that I like to incorporate a lot of. Uh, uh, same with a Fox Farm Big Bloom. You know, not that uh, uh, you couldn't make it yourself uh, uh, cheaper. You know, it was just it was already made up. It was in a bottle. It was easy to filter, you know, and I could incorporate it very simply into a system like that. Back then, I was very much hooked on the bottles. You know, <laughs> I wasn't into making my own stuff. I hadn't discovered the uh, 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 how to do that yet and uh, uh, how easy it is and how uh, cheap it is. It, it's a fun thing to do with your, your home garden you know, make your own uh, compost season, stuff like that, if you're set up for it and you know how to do it right. Yeah. Uh, but that's really where I found my uh, quality took a big turn, and I really wanted to figure out how I could get that same quality with organic soil. And uh, uh, I really didn't uh, – uh, I was actually shown that by a different friend of mine uh, when it came to organic soil. His name was uh, Nate Gosling. He runs a company called Organic Matter Soil. And uh, I've been helping him with this. Uh, again, he was a medical gardener uh, back in the day, and uh, he had been uh, using his own soil and reusing it for years and years. And eventually all his friends ended up, uh, you know, saying, hey, man, you know, that's a great soil recipe you got there. You want to make some soil for me? And now he uh, does not uh, uh, grow medically. He sells soil and a lot of it every month out of here in Eugene, Oregon. And I really, really love his soil. I get uh, uh, the most amazing yields uh, with that uh, uh, soil and uh, uh, amazing quality. By, uh, uh, with just a, a, a full power and a little bit of uh, a, a seaweed, you know, and uh, even better uh, when I can incorporate other uh, amino acids and uh, uh, silica, you know, that was uh, another really big game changer uh, with uh, uh, that uh, uh, that line. But uh, but uh, when we, when medical gardens were pretty much the uh, the thing, you know, uh, you were really limited to the number of plants you could grow. So, uh, so I'd go into these gardens, uh, these big medical uh, facilities, and instead of them uh, growing with trays, they'd be growing in like 75-gallon or 100-gallon containers and basically be growing in outdoor-sized plants in an indoor environment. You know, so you'd go into there, there'd be a, a trellis that's, you know, uh, up to 14 foot tall. You know, there's a, a light way up, up on the ceiling, and you got these great big old trees growing in there. And uh, with the, I found with living soil, you know, you get pretty darn good yields that way, uh, you know, with pretty low maintenance throughout your veg cycle, as long as you got someone to help you chop that monster down uh, when it comes time to trim it, you know, and uh, uh, and you make sure that you clean up the bottom very, very tightly uh, as you're going. So uh, so uh, uh, maintaining a, a, a good uh, 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 trimming uh, uh, regimen is absolutely imperative when they're growing those monster plants. But I would see these medical gardens uh, uh, growing plants and, you know, they get, you know, decent yields, you know, you know, two and a half, three pounds of light. But I saw a couple of these gardens uh, that were getting, you know, uh, uh, you know, damn near, you know, four and a half, five pounds a light growing these giant medical plants. You know, uh, uh, I saw one uh, room that was it was a 212 light room and uh, they started incorporating full power and they're just using the water that was uh, it was hand watered. And it was just basically the water runoff from their dehumidifier and their uh, uh, their air conditioner. And, uh, uh, you know, they started incorporating full power with that. You know to help buffer the ph of the the water you know so they didn't have to use uh, any harsh ph up or down uh and uh, uh you know doing that and uh, uh you know uh, uh having a, a good co2 system uh, in there and having their uh, a big thing the air conditioner really dialed in uh you know they had amazing yields i think they were pulling uh, a damn near 90 pounds out of a, a 24 light room you know uh, of good organic uh, flour you know uh, you know they just had a, a particularly long veg cycle you know, but because uh, it was set up that way, you could have a very, very small bedroom that feeds, uh, you know, two relatively large flower rooms and reduce the amount of people that are required to maintain a very large garden. You know, but it's a lot of work growing those big plants. I haven't met a single commercial garden that started with big plants that has not converted to multiple smaller plants <laughs> in raised beds or in pots. You know, I'm a huge fan of uh, uh, organic raised beds, you know, even shallow ones. 
you know, uh, where you can have multiple plants. It's something about that symbiotic where the roots can live together, even in uh, even in a uh, a chemical environment. One of the best, uh, 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 let's say, uh, not uh, legal gardens I saw back in the day was just filling up uh, four by eight trays with rock wool and planting, you know, I think uh, uh, sixty plants in there and flowering it with a couple thousands over the top. You know, <laughs> they were, they, and again, it was just a top feed system, but that bed gave them way way higher yields than i had seen uh, uh with plants that were that size you know, so they were getting you know uh two and a half uh out to three ounces out of their 60 <coughs> over my uh four you know three and a half to four that i was getting out of my 20. you know so they were getting uh, a little bit better yields than i was getting but uh they were also one of the first gardens i ever saw use mills fertilizer which uh, uh which was an interesting thing as well. You know, I, I, I like that food. I think it, I think it works very well, but I think it just needs a little bit of tweaks to get the quality uh, that uh, is, is capable with a, with a product like that. You know, I've seen a lot of uh, a large scale commercial gardens that are using those, those simple two parts. And uh, uh, all it takes is a little bit of work, some foliar sprays, a couple additives, and you can take what was a, a really nice commercial uh, grade flower and make it, you know, uh, a damn near a, a, a boutique cannabis, you know. But it just depends on, again, you know, how much they really care about their their flower and and how well they're doing it. You know, I, I've seen guys that use terrible fertilizers, but because they dry and cure their plants so well, it's much harder to tell. <laughs> you know, much, much harder to tell. You know, that was uh, the thing that would drive me nuts about my buddy Rick is, you know, uh, he, he didn't really didn't flush his plants uh, that often. You know, uh, he didn't really incorporate a lot of water at the end. He did pretty much run fertilizer to the last week, you know, where, I, where I'm going to flush at least one to, to uh, two days for every week of flower. So if I'm going to be flowering for eight weeks, you know, that means I need at least eight days to 10 days of plain water at the end to metabolize the food that is built up in those leaves at that time for that hydroponic system, you know, where he's just, you know, he'll run it to last five days. Then he just fills up his water, his uh, reservoir of water, but he would spend an extra, you know, whereas I was drying my stuff in two weeks, three weeks at that time, he would spend, you know, damn near four and a half, five weeks, very slowly drying his plants, mm -hmm. then trimming them putting them into jars or, or bags and then checking them very regularly for that next two to three weeks until they got to the right consistency of a very snappy stem with a slightly moist flower. And once you got to that consistency, seal it up and try to burp it at least once a week after that point. And, uh, you know, his stuff tasted better than mine. Drive me fucking nuts. <laughs> uh, and then that's when I really started incorporating the, uh, the slow, uh, the slow drying with, the flushing and that's when i was able to get a hydroponic flower that would burn to a very nice white ash uh that tasted as uh, almost as good as the uh as the organic uh uh stuff in fact all my friends in corvallis and uh, uh and albany and eugene when i would come down with my flower they'd be oh man that's some awesome organic flower i'm like dude i grew that in a hydro system you know, I, <laughs> I, was organic. I had organic stuff added to it yeah but i was growing with chemicals friend <laughs> you know, and, and I would blow them away because it would look as good or taste as good as their uh, uh, their uh, organics, but they're not taking the time to dry it properly. They're not taking the time to flush it properly. You can get the same bad tastes and bad uh, yields not flushing organics as you can with chemicals. You know, uh, it's about metabolizing the fertilizer at the end of the cycle and making the plant use it all up whether that's in the soil or whether that's stop adding the liquids that you're adding, you know, but you want to see the leaves change color. You want to see them fade. If you don't see that at the end, you know, chances are you're not going to get the flavor and the terpene profile that you should, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, whereas in, when you're uh, flushing uh, in the cycle, that's a salt leaching. That's for the medium. You know, that's just reducing the salt that's there. But if you never let the salt build up from the beginning, if you never get to the point of toxicity throughout your whole cycle, you're going to have a much better tasting flower at the end. You know, there's how big a plant can get, then there's how big a plant can get and still taste good. You know, you've got to choose, you know, just like I see it a lot with today's it's a silica. You know, people use these really expensive monosilicic acid supplements. They run them all the way to the end of flower and they got a pretty dense flower that never burns right. It's a black coal. You know, it doesn't matter how you dry it, how you cure it. You know, you use too much silica. You made the cell walls too thick. It's never going to burn right. You know, silica is accumulated in the plant. You know, in my opinion, if you're using silica properly, you're done by week four of flower. You shouldn't need it after that. And if you do, there's some other extenuating circumstance for that. 
Hmm. You know, I you know, it, I would rather use higher quality silica supplements uh, uh, less often as a foliar spray and very very lightly in my uh, in my bloom uh, uh, cycle than to use one the entire time just as a blanket supplement. Uh, that, in my opinion, reduces quality. It increases resistant to problems. You know, you might have a, a little bit more resistant to, uh, to heat and drought at the end of your flower cycle, which in an outdoor garden, you know, hey, you got to do what you got to do. But in an indoor environment, you should be able to control that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a that's a part of uh, your environment and managing it. Yeah. But, uh, uh, yeah. Well, are we, it's been about an hour and we both got to get doing some, some bioag yeah. stuff. Um, do you want to wrap this up? Any any last things sure, you want to sure. say yeah. about uh, your your consulting or growing Hobbit oh. style? Or j j just quickly, because I I went outside for a minute. Did you actually go through the uh, your soil mix recipe? Uh, no, no, I did not. Uh, 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 yeah, actually, I don't have that in front of me right it, now. It's, if you if you look at the screen. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, so uh, this is a uh, uh, a fancy version of a soil recipe that was given to me by a gentleman who was a, a very old grower in Fall City. And uh, what he used to do was he would take a common potting soil and he would mix it with at least three different types of compost. And then uh, to get his fertilizer values, he would pick uh, three different supplements of every type of uh, additive you know, so he'd have three different sources of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and micronutrients. You know, and he would just pick those out and he would uh, incorporate that into his mix. And uh, he had pretty damn good uh, results with that. So over the years, I've kind of uh, taken that mix and uh, uh, tweaked it. And uh, this is what I used uh, 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 several years in my outdoor garden that worked really, really well. Unless I'm just lazy and I go and buy Nate soil and I just fill it up with that. You know, lately I've been lazy, but uh, but I found that this method, if I got the time to to, uh, to really get it dialed in, I get fantastic results with this. And uh, there's a lot of uh, really, really good pre-mixes out there that weren't available back in the day. So you don't have to buy a million different boxes of blood meal, bone meal, you know, uh, that stuff. You got stuff like uh, the Down to Earth Rose and Flower, the Gaia Green Line. Uh, there's uh, uh, ones that are available from a company we have in Milwaukee called Concentrates. They have their own line of uh, uh, pre-mixes. Uh, they have one that's particularly a 5.53 that I love to death. It's only about, you know, I want to say about $40, $50 for a 50-pound bag. You know, incorporating that with uh, 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 several different composts uh, and, a, and a good quality potting soil and just making sure that the components that you choose, you know, be it uh, 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 compost uh, or soil, uh, mix together. Uh, what am I looking for here? You pick the amendments that you can afford, you know, so uh, so they not only have to fit your budget, but how you want to garden. So if you can't afford or you don't have an awesome place that concentrates that stocks five different types of compost, you know, you can use two or three, you know, uh, just, uh, you know, I found that incorporating uh, my three favorites, uh, uh, fish compost, like Ollie fish compost, worm castings as fresh as you can find, and uh, uh, some sort of uh, either uh, chicken or uh, 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 my favorite, uh, 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 cow manure, you know, uh, Malibu compost, you know, is a really good one that's available out there, you know, and, uh, adding that in with a, a, a bloom premix, like, uh, uh, you know, like rosin flower from down to earth. And, uh, uh, I prefer when I'm premixing my soils to have them closer to a bloom profile than a grow profile when I'm flowering outside. And then I add products like mean meal and, uh, a crustacean meal use products like, uh, amino acids during my veg cycle to boost my nitrogen, but I've got all my slow releasing bloom in my soil, you know, but I don't like having lots of high nitrogen, slow releasing fertilizer in my organic soils because I find that they grow a big, pretty plant, but they can inhibit my flavor if that nitrogen doesn't burn out at the end of the cycle when I need it to. So I don't like to incorporate as much feather meal or blood meal. I'd rather use something like an insect frass or a crustacean meal, you know, it's about the longest, slowest releasing nitrogen that I like, but it's a very mild nitrogen, you know, and plus it adds all that uh, good, uh, uh, what's that stuff in, uh, uh, in uh, 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 chitin? Am I pronouncing that right, Alex? Yeah, yeah, in the insect press. Yeah, 
you know uh i find that uh, uh that uh, uh incorporating that into my uh 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 organic soils makes a big difference in how happy and healthy my plants are and how resistant they are to those problems I run into at the end of every season, be it bugs or fungus or a healthy combination of both. Somebody asked um, if this, if your soil mix here needs to be cooked and I believe it does, right? Because every soil mix needs to be cooked and turned at least once. So uh, what I like to do is uh, mix it up, let it sit for two weeks, turn it, let it sit for another two weeks. And then uh, uh, in a perfect world, I like to do a soil test. They sell those cheap soil tests on the internet for 35, 30 bucks. Get one, test your soil, make sure you're not too high in something and not too low in something, and then go from there. You know, uh, if you don't have that convenience, make sure you at least check the pH of your medium and make sure that it's not too high or not too low. You know, mm -hmm. they sell uh, simple test kits for six, $7, just about every nursery and uh, hydro store in, in the country, you know, and then you're good to go. You know, but you always want to compost all your organic amendments, all your organic soils where you add any organic material, especially nitrogen, for at least a month. You know, you go planting a plant into hot soil and it's going to be like you jumping into the hot tub when it's way too hot. You're just going to stick your toe in it and you're going to pull it out. So you'll get this, you know, pretty plant that the roots never grew into the pot. You know, it's just going to continue to spin in the in the size of uh, that you transplant it into and it'll never grow into that organic soil. Hmm. You know, but... Uh, but you always need a good amount of nitrogen in your soil, no matter what the mix is. I just prefer to have lower amounts of that so of that nitrogen in my soil. And I like to supplement it with top dressings and with liquids, you know, and then when it comes time to bloom, instead of adding potassium and phosphorus, I'm pulling nitrogen away, you know, so that it's still there. It's already built up into the plant. It's readily available. And then it happens quicker, you know, and getting a good, you know, uh, uh, here in Oregon, you know, it all depends on our season. You know, like this season has been terrible. It has still hasn't uh, stopped raining here in Oregon. You know, so I haven't even put plants outside yet. You know, uh, uh, it's just going to be one of those years, you know. And, uh, you know, and if, you know, sometimes we get that rain in mid-September. So if we don't have a good sturdy plant that's well on its way into flower by that time, so it's done by the beginning of October, chances are every week after that, you can chalk off a significant percent to yield unless you are lucky enough to have some sort of a cover or a greenhouse, you know, but that's just gardening in the Northwest. You know, it's a, it's a gamble every season. You know, sometimes it's awesome like last year and sometimes uh, not so much, but uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, anything else guys? Can, can you quickly go through your uh, foliar regimen? Like sure. what you do, when you do it, why you do it? Absolutely. Uh, with my uh, usually what I'm doing for my foliar regiment is uh, on uh, Mondays uh, I incorporate uh, my amino acids, uh, my silica, and my uh, yes, uh, and uh, 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 sometimes seaweed depending on the plant that uh, I, I'm growing at the time. You know I like to add the seaweed to, to uh, make my plants uh, more bushy and more leafy which is the exact opposite of what I want with some of my plants that are already too leafy and too bushy, you know, but usually Mondays I'm spraying with uh, nitro amino and uh, multi amino. I'm sorry, nitro amino and bio super. And then uh, at the end of the week, I'm usually uh, spraying with uh, uh, the uh, uh, on Friday with uh, uh, the uh, either uh, cyto, I'm sorry. Yeah. Cyto plus and uh, 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 full humix liquid or I'm spraying with uh, another uh, silica spray with the bio super silk. Uh, if, you know, and I pretty much do that throughout my, most of my veg cycle, depending on how I'm trying to manipulate my plants. You know, I use the humic acids and the micronutrients and the kelp to keep my uh, nodes tight. Then I use the nitrogen and the, uh, 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 the uh, fulvic acid and the silica to, to stretch. You know, so I've got one that's keeping me nice and uh, uh, promoting uh, lateral growth. Well, I've got the other one that stretches those nodes apart so uh, that I get colas instead of too tight a nodes and too dense of uh, a growth. And I, again, overly bushy, but I, but they're not so stretched out that I get eggs. Everything connects at the top, you know, and I get much more uniform growth that way when I incorporate both uh, uh, fulvic acid uh, and some sort of a nitrogen at the beginning of the week. And at the end of the week, some sort of a, a, a mild seaweed with uh, 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 humic acid. It's just uh, the humic acid is a very, and the seaweed is dark in color. So it kind of makes a mess out of my garden. 
you know, I could spray it a lot more and I have, but, uh, but I just don't like the mess it makes in my garden. So I only like to do that about once a week. And then I'll run that with most of my plants, uh, you know, for, you know, as soon as they're about, oh, uh, once I go from my uh, cutting into my four by four container, I usually give it about a week after that, uh, uh, that transplant to start my foliar spray regimen. Cause I don't like spraying all my plants when they're under six inches tall. Sometimes, especially with uh, uh, sativa dominant plants, they just don't like being sprayed with stuff at that age, you know, because there are in my garden, they're already in a highly amended soil. So they're really more uh, at that point, I'm really focusing more on root stimulation and root growth than I am uh, 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 actual growth outside of the pot. You know, and then when uh, I get to the beginning of bloom, uh, that's when I do a lot of spraying. That's where for, I for, for the root stimulation. Are you using like willow bark or anything like that? To... Oh, uh, if I've got access to it, absolutely. You know, I love taking a, a combination of uh, willow bark and uh, a friend of mine makes a, 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 a lactic acid uh, uh, once a month, and I end up uh, uh, snagging a couple pints from him. <laughs> and uh, I love incorporating those uh, uh, after my transplant, and then again once every ten days to two weeks. Uh, you know, so just before and just after each transplant in my veg cycle, but I'm also incorporating mycorrhizae uh, when I transplant. And uh, if I'm in a raised bed or in a container that's bigger than a number five, I like to use what I call uh, uh, mycorrhizae spikes. So I use mycorrhizae not only in the hole when I transplant just a very little bit, but I take, uh, you know, uh, make a hole that's about uh, about as deep as your middle finger and about as wide. And then I fill that with anywhere from one to two tablespoons of mycorrhizae. And I put anywhere from three to four of those in each pot, about two inches to three inches from the side of each container. And uh, uh, with organic soil, I find that adds a lot more uptake and adds a lot more roots uh, into that, uh, uh, especially when I'm doing pots uh, uh, in, in when I don't, uh, as opposed to when I don't. And if I'm, uh, you know, sometimes I'll do the same thing with Bokashi. Uh, if I'm in an outdoor garden and I've got a lot of uh, 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 organic matter in there and I want it to break down faster. But it just depends on uh, how big a roots I need to produce and the size of container that I'm in. You know, the other a thing I like to do a Indoor, lot what's your preferred pot size? Uh, my preferred pot size uh, uh, is probably a, a, a number two to veg and anywhere from a, a five to a, a 10 gallon to flower. But I'm a big fan of underfilling pots. So I like uh, I like four gallons of soil in a five gallon bucket. I like uh, six gallons of soil in a ten gallon. I like the ability to top dress later on and add more soil as my plants grow, you know. And I like having a very wide, uh, 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 short profile with my with my indoor plants. You know, most of the time uh, I find that that uh, gives me a, a, a fantastic results. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I like to incorporate a lot of. Uh, 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 products like uh, either Cyto Plus, but mostly uh, or, or TM7, just after my uh, transplanting, I find that uh, every time I do that in my uh, in my bedroom, I get an explosion of roots. You know? As a drench or a foliar? As a drench. You know, uh, whereas when I get further into my veg cycle, I don't need to water it on as much. Although I still water, I like to water on uh, you know uh, once every couple weeks just to prevent uh, deficiencies in my organic soil. Uh, but uh, it's when I get uh, to that week before bloom and the two weeks after my bloom has started that I incorporate lots and lots of uh, uh, micronutrients. That's where I'll start with uh, uh, TM7 uh, before I turn my lights down for that first week. And then after I turn down to 12-12, I uh, both in foliar and as a, a drench will be using my Cyto Plus. So I'm spraying the, I go from spraying those on Monday and Friday to spraying the, that combination almost every other day, you know, and I, uh, like to, uh, usually if I'm spraying Cyto plus or TM seven, I'm spraying them by themselves. Or if I'm spraying TM seven, it's because I want to add a different type of seaweed, uh, or I want to incorporate, uh, something like nitro amino, uh, in with that foliar spray. But it, again, it just depends on the effect I'm going for with that plant. You know, if I've got a plant that's yellowing, I'm going to add a little nitro amino, uh, to, uh, to deal with that. If I've got, a, I've got a plant that, uh, is, uh, uh growing too slow, I'm going to start adding bio super uh, and again, a tiny bit of nitro amino to get that stretch. If I've got a plant uh, that is too stretched out and I want to get some tighter nodes, I'm going to, uh, use more humic and, uh, more, uh, of, a uh, you know, something, a seaweed with a, a good, uh, potassium number, like the Cyto plus well, it's like a zero, zero seven, a zero, zero three, something like that, you know, and that will give me tighter nodes 
and helps build up that end number in the, uh, the plant. And that uh, helps trigger me into bloom faster. I found that adding micronutrients for that first little bit in organics really helps prevent early yellowing, which uh, I find is the biggest problem when, when you start to see early yellowing about anywhere from your third to uh, six week of bloom with an organic, highly amended soil, you're not going to get the yields you want. So you need to incorporate some sort of nitrogen to boost that. It's usually because calcium has reduced in this medium or you've used up all the available nitrogen or your plants have just gotten root bound in the container they're in because they've been in there for six weeks by now. You know, and uh, uh, having something that you can either, uh, having the ability to top dress some of that good organic soil that you mix together or incorporating something like a nitro amino or uh, my favorite, the multi-amino or the calmino. Uh, those are my two favorite products for greening my plants up in, in flower. You know, if I'm at the beginning of my flowering cycle, I'll use multi-amino and I like to incorporate it once I get to my second week of flower up to my fourth week of flower, depending on my flowering cycle. So I've got, I've got a sativa that's flowering for 14 weeks. I'm going to be using my micronutrients for my first month, you know, to help uh, trigger me into bloom faster. Whereas with an indica based or hybrid, like, like what most people grow these days, that's done between six to 10 weeks. I'm only going to be rocking that micronutrients in that amount for the first 10 to you know 14 days. You know, as soon as I get flower set, I'm pretty much done enhancing the, my micronutrients at that point because the flowers have gotten set. But using it properly, uh, when I get a good set, it's the difference between getting something that's the size of a pinky in a week or getting something the size of a thumb in a week. And a bigger flower set at the beginning is going to give you a bigger flower at the end. <laughs> But uh, I found that most of my problems with yield were uh, problems that were created during the last bit of flowering, or I'm sorry, the last bit of veg and those first three weeks of bloom. And a lot of that related to the size of container that I was in and the availability of the fertilizer that's in there. So I found that if I had enough fertilizer to get me the, the size and quality and yield I wanted, I would reduce my the flavor and terpene profile at the end because I couldn't flush out the blood meal, the bone meal, and the really heavy shit in large amounts that was in my organic soil. So what I started doing was taking highly amended soil, fluffing it up with soilless mix. So I've got, uh, you know, less fertilizer in my, uh, my medium and then, uh, giving, making sure that I have enough medium that the fertilizer in there lasts me at least six weeks of bloom. You know, and then at the once I get to that, uh, you know, around the five, six weeks when things start to peter out, I can finish off with either a very mild top dressing or with uh, 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 compost teas. You know, and that's really where I can make up for those uh, 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 those uh, flavors and really, you know, dial in a, a plant more specifically when I when I do that. But it just depends on if you're you've got lots of plants on a commercial scale and you're trying to, you know, everyone's got to be the same because, you know, you've got, you know, thousands and thousands of plants you're dealing with or you you're trying to really you've got this awesome plant at home and you're trying to grow it to its peak quality, you know, and you want to get the most you can out of it. That, that's one of the ways you can get there. You know, but, uh, you know, how deep down the rabbit hole do you want to go? You know, how specific do you want to get with your plants? So just quickly to to kind of clarify the whole flushing with soil concept, it, it's like all, all this stuff you're talking about, the amendments, basically you're just saying at some point you're stopping adding stuff, you're just watering with water, letting mm -hmm. the plant decide what is currently available in the soil that it may Even need. More so. I'm, uh, it, I'm incorporating products like a, a, one of my favorite old ones that's not available anymore was called uh, uh, The Pure. It was made, made by a company called OGT. Uh, there's one that's available now, available from a company called AEA called Spectrum DS. And these are bacterial-based products that are meant for uh, large-scale desalinization of crappy farmland. So you take these products to uh, re rejuvenate old corn uh, fields and uh, places where they use too much mineral salt in their medium. And uh, uh, when you water those on your organic soil, it helps not only flush away all the salt that has been made available, uh, but it helps uh, stop the process of that salt uh, being uh, uh, uptaked through the soil. So it allows the plant to metabolize all of the fertilizer that's left in the leaves themselves. And once you get the plants to do that, that's when you get that beautiful fade to purple, beautiful fade to yellow, because it's not uptaking the, the stuff because there's still plenty of stuff in the soil. You're just slowing or stopping that process so it can metabolize what's in there and you're finished out for the last 10 days. But if you went past that 10 days, 
that fertilizer is going to be made available again and the plants will continue to grow and will inhibit your flavor but it's about stopping that uptake for that last little bit that last two weeks you know in a chemical environment we did that with peroxide and with salt leaching solutions you know to, you know and we just stopped watering with the minerals and that took away the fertilizer altogether but with an organic soil you've got all that stuff in there and no matter what you do there's still going to be some left over but it takes a while to build up to make that microbiology you know uh, make those salts available so what you do is you flush away those salts that have been available so that the plant so that the soil has to you know it takes it a couple of weeks for it to catch up to what you just did you know hmm. and that reduces the sodium content of the medium and uh, uh, allows it to use what sodium or, or basically what the, what it's metabolized through the roots at that point you know and that's why i like to give my plants a solid it, it, the bigger the container they're in the the uh, the, uh, the longer that process takes so in an outdoor garden with a hundred gallon container i'm going to use a product like that you know about three weeks from harvest you know and then i'm gonna uh, uh start watering with plain water you know until i get to my last week and then i'm gonna back off on my water because i don't want to get mold you know whereas in an indoor garden i'm gonna use a product like spectrum ds you know maybe two or three times you know but i'm gonna use it like uh you know let's say i'm two weeks from harvest i'm gonna use it today you know and then i'm gonna water and I'm going to use it again, and then I'm going to go to water. And then, <coughs> if I want to be real fancy, I'll incorporate some sort of an enzyme, preferably a fresh-made uh, 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 sprouted CT. But you could use a SLF 100 or a, a, a or a, a, a nitro or hydrozyme or one of those. They, they work okay, you know. And I'm going to run that through my yeah. That's the stuff. Love this stuff, you know. And uh, you know, and I basically use this similarly to the way I use a salt leaching solution in a hydroponic system, you know, and it's going to help reduce uh, the salt buildup in the soil and it's going to uh, make the plant use what's there. Uh, if I have a problem with a plant like in veg, like uh, uh, sometimes I get that when I grow my plants too big uh, in too small of a container and they start to yellow up on me, you know, and they start to look real ugly. I hit them with Spectrum DS, you know, let them dry a little bit good mycorrhizae, transplant them, and then they blow up twice as fast as if I don't do that. You know, uh, when uh, the pure was available, uh, uh, I would uh, use a lot more of it, but uh, uh, unfortunately, Tanio products are not as easy to get or readily available as uh, uh, they could be. But I do love their products. So, so it's a blend of uh, micros, basically, I'm seeing. Uh... Uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, 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 those microbes help uh, 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 reduce the salt in the medium, you know, and they help with stress. You know, and uh, I find that uh, uh, because it's uh, more of a large scale farming product, one little, they sell it like a, if I remember right, the bag I usually buy is for one acre, you know, and it usually lasts me a year, you know, cause I'm only using it a couple of times a cycle at the very end, you know, and, uh, uh, but uh, I find that uh, incorporating products like that and making again uh, uh making sure that you don't have too big of a container and you don't have too small of a container you know bigger containers are more forgiving they're going to be easier on your back they're going to be easier to manage with a bigger prettier looking plant but your flavors and uh, uh uh being able to metabolize all that food at the end uh you know that uh, uh that can uh, you know uh that can reduce your quality you know it's about metabolizing what's there whether it's a hydro system or whether it's whether it's uh, uh whether you're using organic food or whether you're using chemical food you got to use what's there and if uh, a plant is army dark green when you chop it down instead of having that fade it's just not going to taste as good all right i'm cognizant that you guys have stuff to do so, uh, yes. Uh, yes. I, I, I can talk all day unfortunately well, I think I think we need to do a round two at some point. Yeah, percent. Yeah, because I, wa I wanted to talk your drying and curing process and stuff like that, but I think we can. Uh, Absolutely. And then teas versus extracts, and um, yeah, and then and then just kind of like e even just kind of your observations on the where the the hydro store market has gone over the past twenty years. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's. I think uh, that'd be interesting. Hard. What's the current Monday? What's yeah, we that? We have to do a couple of those because I I can talk yeah. about that for a long time. <laughs> I was saying we could do that next Monday. Sure. I'm Josh on again next Monday. <laughs> uh, I'm always available, so you you guys grab me when uh, you want me on, and uh, you know I love talking too much. <laughs> <laughs>
and everybody appreciates you talking. So I'm glad to help. You know, what I want is I want better quality pot everywhere I go. I want to find Oregon quality in Oklahoma. I want to <laughs> find it in Nevada. I want to find it when I go to New York, you know, and I want them to develop their own quality. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just a matter of time. We've just been doing it longer over here on the West Coast. <clears throat> That's the only difference. They'll catch up. Yeah. All right. Well, should we uh, call it there? I think so. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, the only housekeeping I have is we may do a breeder roundtable this afternoon, although I need to check in with everyone to confirm that that is indeed happening. Uh, And that's about it. Awesome. Cool. So, Alex, do you want to hit that big red button that says end broadcast? Yeah, yeah, I got you. Bye, everyone in chat. Bye, everyone. It was nice talking. (laughs) He now has the power. I've got the power.